and uh, we are going to start with having a look at your most recent games as per somewhat uh, traditional. Okay, so King's Gambit and uh, in this position White basically has got two main choices. One is Knight F3 which directly denies the check and the other one is Bishop C4. Now against Bishop C4 in my opinion the best way to play is to actually give the check right away uh, in which case White plays King F1 and then you immediately throw the pawn back at them by playing d5. The idea with this pawn d5 move is that you want to accelerate your own development. At the same time you want to either lure a pawn to d5, which would mean that the bishop is no longer attacking f7, or if the bishop takes, then knight f5, uh, sorry, knight f6 comes with the tempo. Okay. Okay, and very often you find that after they take, you just uh, develop your pieces to normal squares, and now you hang on to the pawn on uh, f4. Okay. And the king on f1 is a bit of an awkward uh, customer in this case. Bishop c5 is almost always bad against king's gambit scenarios because it allows d4. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> okay, so as soon as you play it, you realize that, oh, actually, hang on, I just stepped into d4 really, really hardcore. And then I suppose this was the point when you realized that the check was a possibility. So you went for it. Uh, but yeah, it would have been far better without this uh, bishop move here. Okay, and I have free queen back. So, yeah, this is tricky because now you have to retreat with the queen, but you can't really come here anymore because the pawn is hanging. Now, that said, I think that we have to part with the pawn already because if you play a move like queen f6, the problem is that you are stepping into even more attacking moves. So, eventually what's going to happen is that uh, he's going to play very useful moves, keeping... Uh, uh, keeping your queen attacked and eventually you will have to uh, give up the pawn anyway So you might as well give in right now and start playing developing moves as soon as possible Yeah, I kind of got caught. Yeah, so this way you try to hang on to something that you can't really keep but you even uh, ruin your own natural development Okay, knight c3 d6. So here knight d5 would have been uh, a very logical and very strong move and after queen I don't know where Bishop takes, and this is a really sad picture when you see this many white pieces developed versus this many black ones. So if I may use this as an example, this is the ultimate failure uh, when it comes to playing an opening where we have got no development, no central control. Um, yeah, so things really went out of hand here. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm a bit reluctant to give in to 97-2 because technically it can mean that if they take after king takes, our well, king is stuck in the middle, so perhaps my preference slightly would go towards knight c6. Especially because if we are super lucky, we might be able to play a bishop move like this and castle here, trying to capitalize on the opposite, uh, well, not castle kings, but the fact that your king is here and this is there, it might give you some uh, initiative. So, yeah, instead of this, I would heavily have favored knight c6, bishop here or here, and trying to castle here. Castling long is very handy, given that you have got an open d file that you can create a pin on immediately. Right. Okay. 97b3, that's a really terrible move. Knight d7. Uh, is there a reason why you prefer to move the knight here instead of here? Um, I, I expect I, I, I expect a no, by the way. So I'm being a bit yeah. of a douchebag by by asking that question, but yeah. So um, yeah, leading by question is the idea. So you definitely should have put the knight on c6 because the knight on d7 does nothing at all that it couldn't have done from c6. But from c6, you actually allow your bishop to come out and again uh, castle. So that was a clumsy move. In general, you don't like to put your knight in front of the bishop, especially in a case where it can go there. Okay, spectacular blunder. I'm glad you spotted that one. Good job. Uh, e6, alright, queen there. Hmm. Okay. This is a bit too gutsy for my liking. Uh, I would have taken this queen takes and then tuck my king away here. And the idea is that now you are threatening with uh, queen e3, uh, swapping a queen and 
threatening mate there. In the D play, rook e1, you just drop the queen back to f6, covering the mate, offering a queen swap. And this king is going to find shelter very, very soon after something like pawn c6. You can just tuck it away that way. Okay, because if I'm calculating now queen e3, what's happening if they take on here? Um, I was just going to hide my king on d8. But then I take this one with a check too. Yeah. Okay, so the, the problem is here, I think what you may not have realized, Kurt, and this is something that uh, we have a keen eye for, uh, when uh, we place a queen on the same file with our king, we are always very nervy about this. And that's right. exactly what could have happened to you after ED, because if you take back with the bishop rook e1, and all of a sudden we lost the winning game. Right. And so what you're saying with king d8 makes sense, but sadly after check, king takes and queen drop back, we are losing a game. Because I managed to defend the mate and um, I'm a piece up as white. So queen e3, whilst I like the logic behind it a lot, and it's an ambitious attacking move, was a bit too hasty. In fact, you even could have played probably here, as I'm looking at it now, and after takes king here. Oh no, check hurts, never mind. Now, I like take, take, king back here, and now queen e3 is going to pretty much force them to play rook e1, and after queen f6, the game is in the pocket. Yeah. Okay, so they took on f7, you went king d8, and the queens came off the board too, but now you are the one with an extra piece. Knight f6. Uh, potentially, I'm looking at knight e5 as well, hitting here and here. But I don't mind knight f6. Okay, let's see. Bishop d7. Yeah, this check is a bit annoying. Rook there. Mmm. I think I was getting low on time. And I screamed at my computer when I played that move. Okay, so you realize that after bishop takes knight, takes knight e6, check would have hurt you big time? Yeah. And also blunders that pawn too, but my opponent also blundered, so... Yep. Alright, so actually this is not the end of the world, because if bishop takes knight takes, knight e check, king here, knight takes, rook takes, you are still ahead in material because of the two pieces, and we are going to eliminate this pawn here easily. So this is no dramas at all. Um, he took on h7, which is quite fancy. And you played the correct move, I reckon this is best. Rook takes, knight takes, yeah, it's game over. Oh, you lost it on time. Yeah. Oh, dagnam it, man. What a pity. Oh, that breaks my heart. Yeah. I was playing, it. it's a 10 minute game, but I, I'm still, I got confused uh, when that pawn was on my 7th rank. And I was trying to calculate and I just ate up on the time. Look, uh, if you find it that it is a regular occurrence that uh, you tend to lose winning games on time because you use too much time in the middle game. I suggest you play with some slight increment. Okay, two seconds per move, three seconds per move, you name it. That would be sufficient enough after you build up some experience to win a position like this. Yeah. Okay, if I had three seconds increment on this position as black, I would beat Kaspar over a thousand times out of a thousand games. No problems whatsoever. Okay? Because it's so winning that you don't really need much time, just enough to make a move. Okay? So this is going to come to you naturally, but for this reason I suggest that if you find that it's annoying and it regularly occurs, that you play with some increment. But other than that, it was a reasonably well played game. Um, okay, let's move on to this. Goody. Now I hate yeah, I to I hate to show you this. It's called the Danish Gambit. It's a fairly common opening among club players, and I really don't like to show you what I believe is best here because it goes against my chess principles. But I read an article in a Russian chess magazine a couple of uh, years ago where they have claimed to refute, uh, where they claim to have refuted the uh, Danish Gambit by this super ugly queen e7 move. The idea behind this move is that uh, white does not have a decent way to defend the pawn on e4. If bishop d3, what do you think we are going to do to uh, exit pressure on here? 
Uh, just develop the knight. Second best move. Um, I throw the pawn at, I guess. Very good. D5. And now they really don't have a meaningful way to guard it. Okay, so essentially, um, best for white in this position is to try to do something like knight f3, queen takes the pawn, and bishop e2 with the intention of casting the heck out of here really, really fast and exploit the huge lead in development. And if white were able to do that, that would make this whole concept uh, totally dumb and ridiculous for black. However, black has a very clever move here that grants the advantage to black immediately, which is d3. And please remember this, it's a very important tool that we like to use a lot, that when we are ahead in material, for the sake of neutralizing your opponent's initiative, it's totally okay to shred some material, to give some back, in this case to force a queen swap, because now we are still a pawn to the good, but the queens are off the board, so the likelihood that our opponent is going to develop some sort of initiative is zero. Okay, now please remember that this is an extremely rare case that an early queen move like this can be good, especially when it blocks a bishop in. So this is one in a million. Okay, take bishop c4. This is stock standard theory. Takes bishop takes knight f6. This is still a theoretical line, e5. And you need to remember one thing uh, about these e5 moves which uh, applies mostly to e4, e5 openings, but actually it happens a fair bit in uh, stock standard lines, is that you try to counter it all the time with d5 at the uh, right moment. So something like check, knight out and d5 is always a good way to counter this concept. So what you don't want to do is to get stuck with your knight jumping around on the board and uh, your opponent is uh, at the same time developing like crazy. Okay, so like right after knight e4, they have got bishop takes f7 followed by queen check taking your knight. Are you with me? As well as queen d5 hitting here and hitting here. Yeah, Bo over. Both cases, not quite because if queen d5 we can play knight g5 that covers here, but this is already an ugly scenario that you don't want to be in. I reckon best is takes takes and then queen d5 and then taking the knight next, but uh, yeah, this is not pretty. This is not pretty. Okay, so he played queen b3. Um, queen e7, okay. I suppose we had to. Knight c3. Knight takes. I don't mind. G6. I do mind this. Okay, so this is a very, very ugly looking move because you already see that there is a bishop on the diagonal. So if this pawn gets pushed, then uh, we will be try in trouble here. Uh, what I suggest here is uh, knight c6 followed by d6. Because you desperately need to develop your stuff and um, you need to get out with your pieces. Also, potentially better would have been here knight c5 that would have allowed you to take this next to the check and the most important point about this capture is not the fact that you take a pawn but it's a check and so that gives you enough time to develop another piece and castle the heck out of this position here okay so take take g6 oh okay this i don't believe in if i was uh white here i would have considered here 92 to block off the e file so the d6 works, or or knight e2. Actually, potentially knight f3 too, and then just castle. And uh, white has got a very very nasty initiative. Please note that as soon as you put this guy here, bishop b4 becomes very so strong, denying your hopes about castling. And you definitely don't like playing moves like c5, because it creates weak square here, weak square here, backward pawn here. Okay, so your opponent took your f7. Obviously, the idea was that after queen takes, queen takes, king takes, he has got e6 check winning this. The only problem is that if you play king g8 and take, then you will win far too much material. He actually chose to do it this way, which is also legit. Um, and consequently, you should have played queen back, which is ugly again, but very effective because you just simply will take back on the rook. Right. Okay. So, yeah, 
If it's given to you, you take it. Bishop c5, b6. Yeah, this is a bit too slow. Uh, with b6, you obviously announce to your opponent that you want to play here, right? Exactly. So what would hurt you really hardcore here if they played something like this? And all of a sudden, you can't do what you wanted to do. And if that means that you can't go this way and you have to develop this way, then we, you wasted a huge move. Um, you know, that could have been spent far better. I think okay. you were also conscious the fact that bishop d7 didn't work because this was hanging. So yeah. a cure to that problem would have been to drop the bishop back and then play bishop d7 and then castle. But that is way too slow and you are very likely to die to something like rook e6, bishop d7 and knight g5. But that said, actually I can't do that because f2 is hanging. Okay, so yeah, maybe it's doable. Uh, but once again, your position is dead lost, so you are more than likely going to die anyway. And at least now we managed to finish development nicely. Knight here, I don't like that move much. What I do like here is something like rook d5 maybe, putting pressure here as well as threatening check and taking yeah. the queen. And I would also like to try something like g5. Because I am a very aggro type of dude when it comes to chess. Actually, this is by far my favorite move in the position. Because I want to dislodge this knight by playing g4 and then attack this. They can't take me because f2 is hanging. And so how do they stop g4? If h3, I'll just play h5. Yeah, I definitely didn't see that. Okay, so this is where... When you are basically a rule of thumb, if you are behind in material, you desperately need to find initiative. Because if you are down in material and it's our opponent who has the initiative, it feels like we are losing doubly. Or we are losing two games in one go. So yeah, my, my other rule of thumb, which I believe I told you last time when we had our first lesson, was that when you feel like you need to go back, just don't do it. Okay, so anytime you are about to move a piece back, just picture my face in front of you, however, however ugly it is, and just imagine me telling you, don't go back, always go forward. Yeah. Okay, and when that one in a million or one in a hundred exception comes about when going back is good, I will always make a special case of apology to you. In all the other cases, just please go forward. It's as simple as that. Okay. 97, a4, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes. Mm. Okay. Was there anything wrong with coming here? Say again? I said, was there anything wrong with coming here? Which appears to me oh. to be 10 times safer than going to the middle. Yeah. No, there's nothing wrong with it. No, nothing at all. And you are threatening with mate down there, so it's not like they can do much. And even when a5 and a takes b6 hits, you will be able to retake with the bishop, and then that bishop will temporarily cover up everything. Whereas on d7, you are already exposed to a variety of checks, and that just doesn't look uh, like a happy case. Well, that is if your opponent doesn't blunder into a mate. Now, uh, you had a mate in two here that you missed, and you had a mate in three here that you also missed. So we need to work on our mating patterns a little bit. So this is our first opportunity. Please don't look at the side of the screen because it shows you the solution. Let's find a mate in two for black here. Uh, I hate to say this, but I reviewed this game and found the mate I missed already. <laughs> okay, so you figured it out. Okay, so this is actually the unusual pattern. It occurs fairly infrequently. The more usual mating pattern that I want you to memorize is the check. Bishop, well, bishop here is mate right away. But this is again an unusual mating pattern. The one that occurs most frequently is that you drop the bishop back here and then check and then checkmate. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so that's done. Yeah, so here you missed the uh, mate, mate, mate. <laughs> <laughs> all right, takes, takes, chook, chook, bless you, chook. Okay, 
Wow, that's a beautiful checkmate. That's why I didn't do it because he wanted to give a nice mate. I like that's that. It. I like that. I like that. Okay. Alright, against the Alakine, I suggest that we play d4, d6, and knight f3. Not that the move you played is wrong, but um, yeah, there will be a bit of theory to be learned there. d4, d6, and then takes is stock, stock standard if you play with c4, d4. Okay, and okay. normally they take back this way, and then knight f3, knight c3, actually it's knight c3, bishop e3, normal developing stuff. It's a passive opening, black has already given up the center, nothing to fear. Okay, you had no reason here not to play d4. Okay, remember when I told you, or if I didn't, then I'm telling you now, that the basic rule of thumb with e4 is that when you play e4 and move 1, you're going to play d4 against everything that allows d4. So c6, d4. d6, d4. Um, b6, d4. e6, d4. And likewise, any time when you have an opportunity to play a move like that, you do it right away. Okay, there is no way that there is a better move in this position for white than d4, especially because in this case it's even threatening with a fork, other than the fact that it's the most convenient developing move. I'll tell you where it lies the difference. If you play knight c3 first, after something like e5, you won't be able to play d4 without allowing me to swap it off. Right. Okay, so it's very important that when you have the opportunity to grab the center, you grab the center. Because whilst I can't stop you from playing knight c3 after d4, if you start off with knight c3, I can stop you from playing d4. Okay, bishop g4, well he didn't, but that's again a different story altogether. Um... Right. Okay, my only question here is that why don't we play this move? Uh, I suck at chess. <laughs> no, you don't. I tell you why you didn't do it, because you thought that this one was hanging. Yeah, I think I ended up dropping from that piece anyway, later. But actually, this is an illusion. Knight takes c4 is a losing move. That's your next puzzle to work out why. Oh, queen check, yeah, on a4, wins the knight. Bingo, remember this motif in the Alakine, which is what this opening is called, the Alakine, Alakine's defense. It occurs a fair bit that uh, black can't take on here because of uh, the check and then we take the knight. Okay, all right, queen e2, should take spawn takes. Um, Please note that that's another very common motif in the Alakine that you actually can take with the bishop because if the knight were to take you here, bang and bang. Oh. And so they have to spend a move on guarding b7, which allows you to spend the time, the move on guarding c4. And with the two bishops, you have got a far superior position here. Okay. All right, let's go back. Knight d7, bishop f4, castles. Um, okay, this move is screaming at me because it forces the knight back there where it's not a happy chappy. Yeah, that looks terrible. Yeah, that is the ugliest piece on the face of earth. When you can attack a knight with a pawn move, a developed knight, you always look at that because very often you find that you can chase it to a very awkward square and that's certainly the case here with c5. Oh my god. Okay, uh, what would have been the most straightforward win way to win the game here, Kurt? You missed the continuation that wins a lot of material by force. Uh, take, D, I say, take D6 and then fork on F7. Brilliant, why didn't we do it? Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Right, so th I thought that was the reason why I took on D6 in the first place with the bishop but okay so yeah these tactics are the things that uh, we need to focus on not missing because uh, they will give you very easy wins clearly they give you very easy wins anyway yeah he just 
Write it down. Yeah, well, if your idea is to get rid of with all the stuff on the board and just win with the 55 pawns that you have, then rook h6 would make a lot of sense if followed by take, yeah? Yep. Because then you are going to have six queens very soon. Alright, he kindly blundered that knight away for you, so you didn't have to sack it. Cool. Okay, Sicilian. We love the Sicilian. Okay, so against any Sicilian Kurt, we are going to play d4 here. Okay. Okay, that's the open Sicilian. If they play d6, we play d4. If they play knight c6, we still play d4. Against every single move with the exception of a6, which I'm going to deal with later, we are going to play d4. Okay, play in the center. Plus, against e6, it's very, very illogical to play bishop c4. Can you tell me why? Um, because when they play um, d5, I'm going to waste the tempo. Exactly. Right. Basically, what, what's happening here is that he plays e6 and he tells you that, uh, um, I think I'm planning on playing d5. And then you go like, hmm, okay, so let me give you a tempo then to do that. Because now I will have to move my bishop again. That doesn't make sense, does it? No. So what you need to do is to always be aware of what your opponent is trying to do. And since you can't really stop d5, you're better off doing something of your own thing, which you tried to do with bishop c4, but it happened to be, you know, the worst way to meet what they were doing. d4 is best when takes knight takes leads to complicated positions in the so-called Sicilian defense. All right. d5 takes takes bishop back to b3. You have to be careful on occasion c4 might trap you there. Okay, bishop d7 is a horrendous move. <laughs> It's a cheapo that is planning on playing c4. And once again, I seem to notice a tendency or a pattern occurred in your games that your opponent plays a move and you ignore it. Okay? Yeah. If I want to be harsh with you, I would say that that is very arrogant. Because that assumes that your opponent is an idiot and you don't need to pay attention to what they are doing and you can just do whatever you want to do. If I want to be not so harsh, I would say it's super careless. Because then, you know, you are not really prepared for what's going to hit you. He's obviously planning after bishop d7 to plan uh, to trap your bishop with c4. So there are a couple of ways to meet that. c3 is one, but it's super awkward because it blocks in the knight. You can play a3, that is super awkward too. So basically, we have got a couple of awkward moves. Or best would be d3. But then again, I would have liked to play d4 in this opening. So maybe c3 is the... Uh, least of the evils with d4 coming up next and if they play here you can always drop the bishop back to c2 where it stands really well by the way can like, you not play c4? you can but it's super duper ugly because after d4 we lost a lot of space in the center we rendered this bishop into complete stupidity and now our knight can't develop to its natural square either so c4 is a definite no-go plus even after the take take the pawn structure has changed heavily to their favor because now we are stuck with a backward isolated pawn okay i don't think we have talked pawn structures before kurt so i would like to grab this opportunity to do so very briefly so when your pawns are sitting next to each other like that and they have the potential to create chains where they are guarding one another this is what we call a pawn island okay now the less pawn islands you have the better it is for you so when we start the game we have got one giant pawn island they are all connected right right now because of these two dudes are missing we have got a pawn island here that's one we have got another one here that's two and we have got another one here that's three our opponent has got one two as far as the pawn structure is concerned, we are already standing worse. Okay, so this is an important thing to know. And also, an isolated pawn is always a potential weakness, especially in endgames, simply because it can't be part of a chain where it's protected by other pawns, and therefore it's going to be one of your minor pieces' is reliability to defend that pawn. Right, uh, knight g5, even if it didn't blunder the piece, I would really give you a hard time for this move because remember last time I told you that in the opening you are doing two things, developing your stuff, controlling the center. And if you play a move that does neither, it means that you made a major mistake. 
doesn't develop, doesn't control center, and in fact, it doesn't even attack anything. Right? Right. So, absolute no-go. I don't know what your plan with this was, but it was definitely unsound. Rook e1 check looks like a very logical developing move. And after bishop e1, or sorry, bishop e7, you can look at one of these pawn moves that I told you, either c3 or d3, to make sure that your bishop is not lost on b3. Okay, so now g5, c4, um, sad face, take, take. All right, now, um, you could have checked this pawn down, which at least would have given you another pawn for the piece. And given that we are a piece down, and we obviously don't have counterplay per se, you try to pinch as much material as you possibly can for that you can show up for the piece. Plus, there is always a slim hope that we can justify this terrible move by something like this. Of course, you should not hope for such things, because any decent man with a brain in his head would play castles here, and we would be totally lost. But then again, in order to win games, you need to give your opponent opportunities to go wrong. Okay, rookie one there, d4. The other move I would have liked to see is queen e2, with the intention of denying castling, because then the piece will drop. Okay, so that's the reason why we like to castle the heck out of open positions as early as possible. Of course, even after queen e2, if he plays knight c6, you can't prevent them from castling next. And once again, we are dead. Okay, knight c3, knight there. Okay, now, you see this motif here, right? Right. It's guarded by the knight. What could we do that potentially could uh, cause some trouble here for black? Which is directed against this defender, the knight on f6. Uh, knight to d5. Brilliant. See, knight d5. Excellent move. And we are threatening with mate in 2. And it's actually not that simple to defend. The only decent way to do it is to play g6. And then you would take this bishop on e7, and after knight takes, you would have a dark squared bishop in a scenario where your opponent king is chronically weak. Chronically weak on the dark squares. So if you could put a bishop somewhere here, and then a queen on top, they would struggle really badly to keep this diagonal blocked. Okay, for the record, we are still dead lost. But out of nothing, we created a position where there is a lot of play for you. Now, bishop f4 is an otherwise brilliant developing move. But given that we are already a piece down, we needed to take some aggressive measures um, ASAP. Whoa! Oh. That, that is a very subtle attacking move, slightly disregarding again your opponent's moves. This is something Kurt, that we really heavily need to work on that whenever your opponent makes a move, your first 20 to 50 seconds is spent on what is this doing? What is my opponent up to? Okay, because there is no way that if you actually sat here for five seconds, you wouldn't realize that your queen is on. And, yeah. and we could avoid uh, lots of embarrassing losses. But more importantly, when you do something like this, you feel like you just wasted 10 minutes of your life. Because you sat there, you built up a plan, and then, oh my god, I just blundered into this junk. Now I can get started again. So it, it is a very, you know, depleting feeling where you go like, oh, really, is it why I'm sitting here? To then blunder into something basic like this. So yeah, we need to respect our opponent's moves far more than what we are doing presently. Okay. This looks like a good position for black. Okay, C, C, A, for goodness me. Okay, um, if you want to develop this bishop, put it here. Because why wouldn't okay. you? Remember that the ultimate goal is to, to control the center with every single piece you develop. From here you are not controlling any squares at all. From here you are controlling the crucially important E5 square. And then the knight comes here, and all of a sudden you look like you can't break out even with e5. 
It's a yeah. bit too passive. And the other very good move here would have been bishop b4, already exploiting the fact that your opponent played these two pawn moves together, which always creates a giant hole here. So as far as positional chess is concerned, these two together are looking very iffy because that guarantees you that if you plant a piece on b4, they can never ever kick you out from there with a pawn. Right. Okay, so this is a potential weakness. You can choose to put the knight in there too. Bishop would, would look more a bit uh, look a bit more natural. Okay, c5. Don't know if I mentioned it to you last time or not. When you have got tension like this in a position, you very rarely release it unless you gain something out of it. Now your opponent released it with no obvious gain at all, and now you have got a super logical plan to counterattack in the center. What would that be? Um, probably just e5. Very good. Now we can't do it right now. We can, but I don't want to go into that. So you prepare it and you do it next. Okay, what you did is also okay and typical. How could we undermine now occurred this pawn chain? Um, so that something is going to happen inevitably with the c5 pawn. I think I took. Like B takes... No, you played knight e4, which is uh, not necessarily the best move here. Mm. So what I'm asking you is that when you played b6, you wanted to achieve one of two things. Either that they take you here, after which your pawn center will become stronger because you'll replace that pawn with your own, or you are going to take it and then it's a disaster. So now they prevented it to, from being a disaster because if you take, they can take back that way. So in such scenarios, what you want to do is to attack the back guy who is now the most important cornerstone of the chain so that he can't avoid breaking up this pawn formation here. So how can we attack b4? Uh, knight, probably b8 to a... No, I want to attack it right now. Um. Or offer a swap if that's what... Uh, yeah makes it work for you um i'm not sure how about what this it, it... oh yeah uh, duh now uh, that makes sense okay so the whole idea is to undermine the structure because it's so rigid anytime i take out of this i'm going to come out worse because if i take here you take this dude hitting the knight, and when the knight goes away, then you pinch the b6 pawn and you are already a pawn ahead. If I take here, you take here, of course, because that's a central pawn, you already won a pawn here, and you're going to win another here. Yeah. Okay, so this is how we undermine pawn chains. And in fact, it's a lot more common when the pawn is back here still for white. And even then it's super effective because when you play a5, they can't play a3 because after takes takes, the rook would hang. Right. Are you with me? I'm with you. Okay, good. So that would have been your way to undermine this pawn chain because if you miss out on doing it right now, you won't be able to do it again because if they can play a5 next themselves, then it's Gonski. All right, there you go. So now we can't really break out from this pawn structure anymore. That said, it's not a drama because you still have e5 on the ready, which is perfectly sufficient for us to win the game. But then why were we wasting time on b6 in the first place? Okay, this is very good chess that you are doing now. Brilliant. The only thing is I would have clarified the situation probably on the B file, especially because there was a big fat tempo to be gained here by playing rook B8. And actually it's not easy to deal with this bishop now because your bishop is beautifully covering B1, so I can't play rook B1. Also, I'm talking nonsense because I didn't realize that I'm missing a big fat tactics here. What is it, Kurt, that I'm missing here and you are missing it too? Back is to... it, uh, yeah? Is it knight takes c5? Of course. Bingo, knight takes c5. I think I played that. I Maybe think not. so too, um, a tad bit later. 
So yeah. instead of e5, you should have done take take and knight takes. Now to be 100% yeah, fair, I reckon after... Oh, actually I can't do that. Alright, I was gonna play rook... I don't know, we can. Yeah, after rook c1, uh, it's still a bit messy because then there is a bit of a pressure on c6 pawn. But also the a5 pawn is hanging. So I suppose that this would look like a, a good scenario for black with a pawn to the good. Right. Okay, so he played e5, which is otherwise thematic. It's just mistimed. And then we went there. Excellent stuff. Oh, and he resigned. Wow. Okay. I would have I given you. I would have given you a bit more of uh, opportunities to prove yourself. Now this is a little bit uh, positionally questionable because again, if you push these pawns up here and here, there will be an awful lot of terribly weakened squares uh, behind them. So you have to be careful of that. And that too. So in this position you must play d4 and then knight c3. But I don't believe in the whole setup too because we are overextended and they are going to blow up this center very easily. And the problem with overextending is that your pieces are way far from actually sufficiently guarding uh, this uh, center formation that needs a lot of attention and care at the moment. Okay, I would have preferred d4 again, attacking the bishop. And if it drops back, then queen g4 before the knight goes out. The reason why queen g4 is good is because castles, which is traditionally the best way to defend the g7 pawn, would fail to what white move? Uh, bishop h6. Excuse me, brilliant. Bishop h6, and now the only way to dodge the mate for me is the second exchange like this. Right. Okay, remember this queen g4 motif, when the knight is gone from here, and it's not an f6, queen g4 occasionally causes quite a bit of headache. Normally you only can do that in openings, where you have got a substantial uh, space advantage in the center, because otherwise this queen here would be way too exposed. Um, yeah, don't take it, drop back here, play d4, and then drop back here, and again that's our target that way. Okay, that seems to me to be a pawn blunder, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, okay. Uh, castles is your way to go, of course. Castles, castles, and then queen e2 or rook e1. These are standard moves here. Knight e5 is just blundering a pawn. Hmm. Yeah, this is unfortunate. Given that you can't avoid a queen swap, I would have taken here and then put the bishop here, not here. Because from here, once you get out of this pin with the rook, you can then find more meaningful squares to go to with the bishop, yeah? From here, not so much. Plus you are pinned on b2, too, uh, on b2 as well. How the heck did you win? Oh, you didn't win it, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, no. Yeah, okay, and then another tactical blunder. It was a bit awkward. Yep, it is sure. very unusual, Kurt, that in an endgame scenario, you can successfully launch an attack like this. Okay, chances that this will work is next to zero. Now, the only reason why I'm not really giving you grief for this is because there is not really much else you can do in the position because you are 75 pawns down. So whatever you do, you are going to lose anyway. But the general rule of thumb is that it's better to try to find a realistic target, a more realistic target than just randomly leashing out onto the Black King and then, yeah, finding it too difficult to crack. Okay, uh, moving on. Well, this looks yeah, like... Yeah, all these blitz games are really bad chess I played. <laughs> yeah, which means to me, Kurt, one very important thing. Don't do it. Yeah. I mean, if it's not your thing, and it's certainly not your thing, because see, you keep on blundering very basic stuff, uh, then there is no point to push for it. Um, and there is no shame in, you know, being slow. It's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, I mean, this opponent was quite decent, so let's not do blitz. 
I am far yeah. more into yeah. doing yeah. T ten, t ten, or rather something like uh, eight minutes with uh, four, five seconds increment. That would be good. Oh, okay. So this one is a bit of a, a common mistake when they play early e fives. Knight f five is the square you want to go. Perfectly correct. The only problem is that if you go right away, take take and d five and look at those beautiful central pawns. You don't want that. So what we do, Kurt, is that first we sneak in a check. Forcing them to bring the bishop out. Take, take, and then knight f5. And then the other knight can come in here. How cool is that? Yeah, this is great. This is very okay. good. Also, if you think about it differently, by e5, I'm fixing as black already two of my pawns on dark squares which consequently mean that the white squares are weaker and this bishop is trash this is good because it has a long diagonal to travel on this one has nowhere to go so if you could swap off this bishop that would be a huge positional gain because then all the white squares would be more accessible to your knights and he would be stuck with this dumb bishop on f8 so when you are uh, swapping stuff of Kurt, it's not always what you're looking at is that, okay, my bishop is worth three points, this is worth three, so it's even. Okay, it very rarely works in chess like that. Almost always there are more subtle considerations in the position that make a certain swap either favorable or unfavorable to one side. In this case, bishop b5, bishop d7, bishop takes heavily favors white. Okay, so take take knight f6, bishop c4. Again, the worst possible move because it steps into d5 really hardcore. Okay, right. so if I was black, I would want to play d5 against literally anything you do. And you are just stepping right into it. Plus it violates another rule that I may or may not have told you, I don't remember now, which is that the basic rule of thumb of developing pieces is that knights before bishops. And i tell you why too, because this knight 100% stands this square bet the best compared to that or that. Yeah? Yeah. That's 100%. Whether this bishop is going to go here or here or God forbid here is not sure yet. It depends on what they do. If they are not strong enough to play d5 right now, then it actually is going to go to c4, and now d5 is not doable and white is better. If they do play d5, now we have to find a new plan and uh, adjust what we want to do, because now the bishop is certainly not going to go here. We might in fact switch to the other bishop, because by pinning the knight, we put pressure on this pawn. Okay, whereas bishop c4 just looks like a random move thrown into the position and after d5 you got punished for it really, really quickly in a very painful manner. Okay, bishop e7. Okay, so you are both very oblivious to the positional considerations here, which is that black badly needs to break out with d5 and white really badly needs to stop it. That's a little bit of a deeper level of chess, but we really need to get there because uh, it will... Uh, improve on your results a great deal. Okay, queen d7, knight d5. I'm hoping that you realize that this was on. Uh, I did not realize that, no. <laughs> okay, because uh, then again, so we need to really badly get into this habit code that your opponent makes a move and you go like, okay, why did they go there? And as long as you don't have an answer, you don't do anything, literally anything. You need to figure out what it is. And I'm totally okay if your eventual conclusion is that they went there because they are dumb and they can't play chess for the life of them. It's totally okay. But you need to figure out whether that is the actual case or actually, hang on, they want to take my pawn. So it, it can't be just like, yeah, whatever, I'm just going to carry on with my stuff. Uh, and you actually, luckily enough, defend it against the threat because I can't take there because bishop and the queen drops then. And if they take after bishop takes, that is hanging, so they still can't take. But this is more of a fluke than uh, consciously thought out plans. Oh, okay. And then we are not taking on b7. Why? 
Uh, I remember I just missed it. I don't know. Okay, fair enough. Tactical blunders do happen. Okay, very interesting. Uh, the your opponent is playing so badly. Mm -hmm. I quite like that move. In fact, knowing that you really like to simplify positions, Queen C3 would have been another good way. Because not only does it offer a Queen swap, but it also attacks that. That. Mm -hmm. But Bishop C3 is totally fine too. Okay, you are a very cruel customer. Good. All right, one more. Have a look at the last one, and then we are going to do some puzzles and some end games. Oh wow! Look at that. Thirty-minute game. Loving it. Try to make it rated next time. This is my buddy Rob. He's a beginner. Okay. All right. He is a beginner. Um, this looks like a very, very not right move, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, it, it just walls the bishop in for no apparent reason. Bishop back here and then go to one of these squares is the way to go. Like, here he could have actually trapped your bishop. Yeah. That's not pretty at all. <laughs> okay, now it's looking better. Um... Instead of take, I would have preferred push and then take. Let's push these pieces back. Gain space, be aggro. I don't like swapping stuff, especially not like this, because, and it's more of a principal thing than applying it to the actual position, when you do this, what essentially happens, Kurt, is that you swap off this pawn for this. Okay, it's an illusion. People think that when they take here, they swap this for this. That's not what's happening. You swap this for this. Ah, see? These are the dudes that disappeared. And that's a quality change because this is a central pawn. This is a shitty pawn. By which I meant it's a not good pawn. Yeah. Excuse the lingo. So make sure that... Uh, you only do this when there is an obvious gain out of it. And I know that there is an obvious gain because then you will be able to take this. But so could you do that after d4. Okay, take, take. Oh my god. Um, Yeah, I would have taken this dude. And I know that there is a check here, but I do not care. Because I'm focused on mate. Right. Okay. What you did was safe, but unnecessary. All right, um, time to do some puzzles, my friend. Puzzle away, for which reason now I will have to do a bit of a, a trick on the um, recording, if I can. Just bear with me for a second. Yeah. Sorry. Shoot. Oh, what am I doing now? Dang damn it. No, this is not what I'm meant to do, Kurt. Um, I wish I knew how to operate this recording system. Nope. Alright, I'm going to not do this now. No, actually, we can do that. I'll fix it later. Good. Uh, all right. So what we are going to do now is that we are going to look at puzzles and they might turn out to be rather tricky. Um, but that's all right. I'll just let me check if it's looking OK. It's probably not. Um, OK, you see the screen and that's the most important thing. Wow, these are re really hard puzzles, actually. So let's go back a little bit. Okay. Um, 
Wow, I'm really hardcore stuff here. Okay, um, okay, let's start with this. I really don't know what's happening with this thing. Okay. Right, I'm going to stop the recording now because uh, I can't really bring up Chessbase now that annoys the heck out of me and I don't want to lose the recording bit of the lesson if you don't mind. So I'll stop here no. and uh, thank you for your understanding. But now we are going to continue in Chessbase for a couple of more minutes with a few more extra puzzles.